In this segment on worker mobility and migration, I'd like to talk about changes in labor supply. As we do that, I'd like to review briefly the dynamics of changes in labor supply, and I'd like to look at what we consider the classic argument in terms of immigration and its effect on wages and labor. And I'd like to update that argument and see if maybe we can consider some ways in which that argument is more or less powerful than we might otherwise suppose it to be. So we call that the, the updated argument. As we think about the dynamics of changes in labor supply, we have to think about what happens or how we can add the labor supply of a domestic market to the labor supply of immigrant workers to receive some labor supply equation or end up with some labor supply equation that will give us an equation for the entire market itself. To do this, we'll briefly consider the uh, the rules of private goods and, and how we, we uh, aggregate private goods. And then we'll take a look at higher costs uh, that result in steeper uh, labor supply curves. Uh, we'll go further then, and we'll look at that, that classic argument and update argument. So let's, let's take a look first at the rules of private goods. So private goods are going to be distinguishable from public goods in that a private good is rival and it's excludable. So a private good is rival and it's excludable. Well, if we think about labor... I think labor is a private good. Rival suggests that when one is seeking to acquire the good, one might actually be a competitor in that acquisition, and the price might be bid up. So if I'm an employer, and I want to employ you, and another person is an employer and wants to employ you, we both are pretty aggressive in wanting to employ you, then we may become rivals in seeking to employ you, which means we're buying your labor, we're, we're acquiring your labor. So we're competitors in that acquisition, we're rivals, and we may even bid your wage up. That'd be good news for you. Also then, once one of us has contracted with your labor in a full-time labor working environment, it pretty much excludes the other one from being able to use your labor in those same hours. If you've contracted your labor for a day or a month or a year or maybe even an hour or a week for one employer, you really can't cause a different employer to have beneficial utility of that same hour. So labor, I think, fits under the classification of a private good and in that it is rival in the acquisition. Employers are rival in the acquisition of it, might even bid the price up. And once one employer has obtained or contracted that labor, then that other employers are excluded from being able to use that same labor unit in that same period of time. Further, we know that the wage in a competitive market, the wage that one worker receives of a different, of a particular type is equal to the wage that another worker receives of the same type, same kind of job, which is equal to the wage that the nth worker receives if they're that same type of worker, which is equal to W star. So if we're thinking about laborers in construction marketplace, the wage that one laborer receives in Salt Lake City is going to be relatively equal to the wage another one receives, equal to the wage the nth or the last uh, laborer receives, and that's going to be equal to W star for low-skilled manual construction labor in the Salt Lake City market. However, we know the quantity of labor that is brought with one worker and the quantity of another and the quantity added up all the way through the nth worker, is going to equal L star in this relationship. So the labor brought about by each of the different workers can be aggregated into whatever our L star is for our marketplace. And then we further know, since these are W star and L star, that tells us that they're market clearing or equilibrium. So we know that labor supply has been equal to labor demand. And since we know that it's a competitive market, we know that the marginal revenue product of labor is equal to the marginal expense of labor.
We think of this set of rules then as a set of governing dynamics of the uh, private goods, and I've applied these to the labor market. W in the goods market would be P, and L in the goods market would be Q. But in the labor market, thinking of labor as a private good, I think that the dynamics, the governing dynamics of private goods uh, are, hold here for us. So let's assume then for a moment that we actually have two different labor supply curves. We have labor supply of domestic workers, and let's say that that is equal to negative 10 plus 3W. And let's suppose then that we have a labor supply of our immigrant workers. And maybe that's going to be equal to negative 2 plus 2W. Well, if we think about that, how do we then combine these? Because we can use the dynamics of uh, private goods, where the labor of one plus the labor of others added up together is simply L star or L. In this case, we're looking for labor supply. We can then add these by saying the labor supply of the domestic worker plus the labor supply of the immigrant worker is equal to negative 10 plus 3W minus 2 plus 2W. Or else S, or labor supply, is equal to negative 12 plus 5W. And then we can equilibrate that to any labor demand relation that we might have for this environment. So one of the things that we always have to keep in mind is this relationship. If we were to see these, and I won't give specific numbers to them, but if we were to see these, we would see something like this. In a wage and labor space, our classic labor market model, and if this is the labor supply curve for the domestic workers, then we might see something like a labor supply curve for all workers, or just LS, based uh, represented on this different uh, curve. What we're not seeing here expressly is the labor supply of the immigrant workers. We know that that which moves labor supply of the domestic workers and morphs it to the labor supply of the immigrant workers is or excuse me, the, it morphs it to the labor supply of workers generally, is the labor supply of the immigrant worker. So if we know labor supply generally, and we know labor supply of the domestic worker, then we can, uh, we can identify or we can find the labor supply of the immigrant worker, because that's going to then look something like this. Labor supply generally minus labor demand, excuse me, labor supply of a domestic worker is going to equal labor supply of an immigrant worker. And that's just rewriting this equation a little bit differently. We've used a little bit of algebraic sleight of hand here. Just seeing where we can fill in our gaps. Because we're rarely going to find on one graphic the labor supply of the domestic worker and the labor supply of the immigrant worker both uniquely and expressly shown. We might find one of them and then we might find the aggregate labor supply offered to us. Let's think briefly about um, the the slope uh, of uh, labor supply curves and how they differ based upon costs of migration. We clearly recognize that the labor supply curves are going to be upward sloping. So let's say that this is a labor supply curve of someone from nation A, in which case we have some trade-off that we can think about in wage and labor space such that a change in wage from say W to W prime is not dramatically different proportionately in a change in labor from L to L prime. We've talked about elasticity and you might think back to elasticity and this suggests that this might be uh, a relatively um, uh, might be a relatively um, a proportional change. We call that unitary uh, elasticity. This might end up being a change in wage and change in labor, uh, roughly equal to one, but this is for labor supply. We focused in elasticity more on labor demand. Well, what does this look like then if, it, if we uh, want to think about going from this labor supply where a, these changes in wage and labor have brought, been brought about relatively proportional relationships, what's it look like if we are in a 
meaningfully more expensive market to immigrate to. So we're going to suppose that immigrating from nation A to, say, the United States uh, can be justified by this change in wage as one comes to the United States. So, so we've got a, oh, it's not a flat curve by any means, but it's not an ultra steep curve. But if we, if we see a, uh, a labor supply curve for those immigrating from a very expensive environment, then maybe we'd see a labor supply curve that's very steep, such that I know that a relatively small change in labor from, say, L to L prime in the blue is going to require a relatively large change in wage from wage to wage prime. So I have a small gap, small change between L and L prime in the expensive market to come from. So we'll say labor supply from nation B. So that small change in labor supply is going to have to be met with a much greater change in wage in order to justify the increased cost of mobility. And from nation A, well, we had perhaps a relatively normal or relatively proportional change. Separate that then from something very different, let's say a very inexpensive place to migrate from, we'll call this LC, such that we see that here a change in labor from L and W, a relatively small change in, a relatively large change rather, in labor from L to L prime is going to be met with a small change in wage. This must be a labor environment that's very inexpensive to relocate from. Maybe it's Canada moving to the United States in the in labor supply C versus labor supply B. Uh, we would then think of maybe this is someone coming from Zaire or Malawi. Very difficult to migrate to the United States. Very expensive to migrate here from those countries. Uh, so they would be they would be expecting a meaningful increase in their wage over what they'd seen before in order to be able to uh, deal with the cost of migration versus maybe uh, in our labor supply A, maybe this is coming in from Mexico or Puerto Rico. Uh, and uh, it's a not inexpensive move, but it's not a devastatingly expensive move uh, for those that actually have some resources. It may be devastating if you're coming in illegally and you become subject to the vagaries of illegal immigration. Well, let's now look briefly at this uh, this issue of the classic argument and the updated argument. The classic argument in changes in labor supply is going to go like this, and you've seen this, you've certainly heard it. We know that if we have some wage and labor, and we have some, say, domestic labor supply met by some reasonable labor demand domestically, that's going to yield us a W star and L star for our domestic workers. However, if we have an increase in immigration, bringing about a new set of workers into this market, such that we have a new aggregate labor supply curve, so let's say that the first labor supply curve was for domestic workers, and now we've created a new labor supply curve for all workers, I'll call it LS all, both domestic and migrating workers, that this increase in labor supply is believed to suppress wages generally, go from W to W prime, as we have increased our number of workers from L star to L prime. This becomes the classic argument against immigration. Adding immigrants into our Population takes jobs from domestic workers, increases labor supply, suppresses wages, maybe even motivates an informal labor market. I know that uh, those informal labor markets clearly do exist. And all you have to do is on a Saturday morning get into your pickup truck, drive down to any Home Depot parking lot or any job service parking lot, 
and there's any number of able-bodied men and women that are willing to jump in the back of your truck and for five, six, or seven dollars an hour give you a, a fair amount of labor. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we should be paying them that. I think that a, a fair-minded human being will offer a fair wage to a, an adult doing a day's labor. But we know that that informal or that black market exists. So if we want to think about this a little bit further, then what's uh, what's an what is uh, a change in this? What is um, what does this look like? So I've actually already shown you the immigration leading to lower wages for domestic workers, and here we've got that again. But what else happens here when we have domestic or we have international workers, immigrant workers come into our into our marketplace? <coughs> excuse me. We clearly see this change in the labor market, but we also see some changes in the goods market. Let's say this is the goods market for just general products and services that all workers need to consume with some P and some Q. And we see some supply, and we see some demand for these goods in this goods market. Well, I think if this is a domestically produced product, which much of our food is, all of our housing is, many of our consumer durables are, uh, then we see that, and, and all the services, of course, that are provided to our workers and our households here, our domestic services, then we see that this increase in labor supply, bringing about additional workers into our marketplace, similarly is going to bring about an increase in demand for goods and services. And when there's an increase in demand for goods and services, what does any good uh, capitalist or entrepreneur do? Uh, we recognize that when that increase in demand has motivated a higher price, we've gone from P star and Q star to perhaps P prime now and Q prime. Well, we know it's hard to sustain P prime and Q prime because higher prices are ultimately going to yield lower quantities. So this market's going to be motivated to return to P star as quickly as possible and to do that, going to see an increase in supply for this these goods that are consumed at least possibly even produced domestically and when we see that return to p star we then see that we have possibly even a higher level of q i'll call it q double prime well what happens in the labor market when we see this increase in these domestic goods well there has to be an offset in the labor market and that offset is such that we have seen then the, this change in labor supply and demand, and we then see a change in labor demand in the domestic market, as we saw the goods market have increases in both demand and supply as a result of this additional uh, increase in population moving into the um, into the United States. What I'm giving you here is a discussion on both the classic argument and the updated argument. The classic argument tells us that we have immigration moving into a uh, polity, uh, immigrant workers moving into a polity, suppressing uh, suppressing workers' wages, and leaving us with a situation that is, for some, almost unbearable, and creates uh, political unrest, creates, in some places, civil unrest. But when we think about the nation as a whole, we have to consider what happens really in that scenario. We have to consider that the increase in labor supply that we've seen is going to be met with some increase in demand for goods and services, which is going to be met with some increase in supply of those goods and services. And if we're going to supply more of them, that means that the firms that manufacture those goods and services will demand more workers, in which case we see that wages, which would have otherwise been thought to be suppressed, may actually return to their original wage level, or if demand is high enough, may even go up above that. This is a fairly non-rigorous description of the updated argument, but it probably makes intuitive sense to you. Moreover, here's where you can really test this argument long term. This is a nation that really has been built on immigrant labor. As we looked at the 1900s and the early 2000s and some of the immigration statistics, we clearly saw 
that we had significant levels of immigration in almost every decade except for the decade of World War II when that number went down to less than half a million or approximately half a million. Even that is a fair number of workers coming in in a time period of World War. Well, if we believed that worker wages were going to be uh, dampened because of uh, immigrant labor, then we should have seen declining real wages during all of those decades. When in fact, in the 1900s through about 1980, we saw meaningful increases in real wages for, for workers. We saw meaningful increases in gross domestic product or the nation's income as a whole. So we see actually that rather than our society having been dampened or or disadvantaged by immigrant workers coming in, we saw that immigrant workers added to our society. Clearly, in some of the earlier parts of those decades, or those are those earlier decades, we saw some unrest. We, we know that there was a period of time in this country where Chinese workers were very much looked down on. Uh, there were slang terms given to them that will not repeat, but you've heard them. And, and those were given because we were uncomfortable with those workers coming in. They didn't speak our language. They took some of our jobs. We didn't like the effect of that if we were domestic workers or some domestic workers at the time. <coughs> We know similarly the Polish workers, Eastern European workers, Italian workers, Irish workers came in waves into this country between the 1900 and 1940s, huge waves into this country. And uh, as we had great migration from Western Europe, even from Eastern Europe, and we saw that for periods of time, for a generation or two or maybe three, we saw some definite unrest as a result of that. But we saw GDP gains. We saw average income increases. We saw the economy, our society, our polity, our civilization as a whole simply improve and increase. That would be a fairly strong litmus test, acid test, if you will, that we should use when we think about whether or not immigration has been and can be good for this country. So that's a, that's a brief discussion on the classic argument, the updated argument, and that's, that's our basic discussion on labor supply changes.